I have spent decades now working in front of screens of all shapes and sizes, hunched over a laptop, then hooking up to a bigger monitor, then multiple monitors, bigger multiple monitors, and more recently, big ultra wide monitors. I've made videos on these monitors and a lot of the comments of those videos are asking me, of course, which one would I recommend? So in this video, I wanna help you decide for yourself which monitor is the best for you and talk about each of the key areas to consider when buying a monitor. Now, firstly, the one most people start with, of course, is the physical shape and size of the monitor. Now, the most common one is 16 by nine, which is the same format that pretty much all TV shows and movies are shot in. And 16 by nine screens typically come in 22, 24, 27, 32, and 55 inch sizes. Then next up, you have 21 by nine screens, which are referred to as ultra wide screens. And they are typically in either 29, 34, 38, and 40 inch sizes. And then we have my favorite category of all these monitors, the super ultra wide monitors. And these are 32 by nine and come in typically 49 and 57 inch sizes. Now there are a couple of other formats outside of these, 16 by 18 and 32 by 10, which are much less common. But typically I find most people either go for multiple 16 by nine monitors or a single 21 by nine or 32 by nine ultra wide. The next question I get asked a lot and something I look for in a screen is the type of curve and especially when it comes to anything over say 38 inches in size because of that size and without any curve at all things around the edges of the screen just can get pretty difficult to see. You have to lean over to see the edges and you can also get glare and reflections if you don't have a curve but what do the numbers mean and how much curve should you be looking for? Now, in terms of how it works, a smaller number means a bigger curve. So a 1000 R curve would be a deeper curve than say a 1800 R curve. Now, my recommendation would be the bigger the monitor, then look for a bigger curve. Now I saw this on the 49 inch Samsung G9 ultra wide, which has a 1000 R curve, which was perfect. And then they released a newer version, but with an 1800 R curve which I then bought, used it, and just found less comfortable to use due to having to like lean to see the far edges of the screen. The next area is one that too many people skip over. And in the actual fact is one of the most important things to look for when buying a monitor and specifically for productivity. This is less important when looking for a gaming monitor, but for productivity, it is really important. And that is the resolution combined with pixels per inch. Now, generally speaking, the higher the resolution, the better quality the screen will be. Now for 16 by nine screens, this is fairly straightforward. You get 1080p screens, otherwise known as full HD, which run at a resolution of 1920 by 1080, and then 4K screens, which run at a resolution of 3840 by 2160, and then 5K, which is super high resolution on these smaller screens, and that starts at 5120 by 2880. Now, the problem starts when you go bigger and wider since the larger you go with the same resolution those pixels are just getting bigger and bigger and when that happens you'll start to see the individual pixels on text and when you spend a long time writing documents or you know writing in your emails pixelated text can be a really horrible experience now this is where ppi or pixels per inch comes in if your ppi is too low then everything just looks ginormous and you can see the individual pixels if the PPI is too high and everything will look crisp and sharp, but might then cause scaling issues with everything being like really, really small on your screen. Now, generally speaking, again, the higher the number, the better, but beware if you are a Mac user, which lacks the ability to scale independently to the resolution, which is something you can do on Windows. Now on a Mac, you might then be forced to use a lower resolution or put up with everything just being very, very small and very difficult to read. Now I'll link to a website with a table that shows you what is a good expected PPI for all of the various sizes and resolutions because it's kind of too much to go through in readout in a video. I'll link that in the description down below so you can click that link and check that out. Next is another fairly important one, which is the type of technology the screen uses. Now you may have heard of terms like TN and VA and IPS, mini LED and OLED. Now, TN, VA, and IPS are all types of LCD panels. TN panels will be more affordable. They'll be probably the cheapest ones you can get with fast response times and high refresh rates. So they're generally pretty good options for gaming. VA panels will be brighter and have better contrast than TN panels. 
and then IPS adds to what VA is capable of, but with much better color accuracy and better viewing angles, with the exception of VA having the edge slightly on contrast. Although the new series of IPS black panels are actually getting very, very close to what VA can deliver. Mini LED offers improved contrast by being able to dim smaller parts of the screen, but still can be problematic with haloing or blooming in high contrast areas. But OLED takes that contrast to a whole new level by being able to switch off individual pixels to create a truly like stunning contrast and picture quality where blacks are well and truly black. But OLED panels are also thinner and therefore lighter and consume a lot less power. Now with all of these panel types, there is one thing that you might want to pay close attention to if your work has anything to do with like graphics design, video editing, photo editing, and that is color accuracy. You'll have heard terms such as DCI-P3, Adobe RGB, and sRGB. And in this case, the higher the number, again, the better the accuracy of colors. So in this Dell monitor's case, with 99% DCI-P3 and display P3 color coverage, it is excellent. Depending on your budget, there are two ways you can go here. If you are on a budget, then start from the bottom and work your way up. Although I would start with at minimum a VA or an IPS panel just to get you going. Or if you're a premium buyer and you just want the best, start from the top and look for an OLED if you can, as I just think the technology is far, far better, particularly on a screen that is likely to be on for like six to eight hours a day if you're using it for you know day-to-day -day work. And then taking into account things like power consumption and just how light they are overall. Because kind of with that said, buying a monitor is similar to that graphic of, uh, I think it's good, fast and cheap, where you can only select two things at once. You're not gonna find a monitor that checks absolutely all of the boxes and at an affordable price. So just decide which of these specs and features are most important to you, go with those first, and then see what options you're left with. Next up is refresh rate. And this is one that's not as important for productivity as it is for gaming, but it is worth considering still. Now what the refresh rate does is essentially it smooths out the motion on your display. Now if you were to pick up and drag a window, it is the difference of seeing a blur when moving a window to actually like seeing the window move around. Now in gaming, this is really important because going from say a 60 Hertz display to a 240 Hertz display, gameplay footage is much, much smoother and way more enjoyable to play. Now for productivity, this doesn't really matter much if at all. But what I will say here is that I did see a noticeable difference in a good way when going from a 60 Hertz display to a 120 Hertz display. So whilst I wouldn't say it's essential for a productivity monitor, it kind of is worth considering. And if anything, buying a higher refresh rate monitor today only future proofs you more as technology evolves in time, or maybe if you do want to get into gaming later on. Now, for those of you buying a monitor with crazy high refresh rates of like 240 Hertz or even higher, just be sure that your gaming PC is actually powerful enough because right now, especially at the high resolutions, only the latest and the most powerful PCs will be capable of actually driving those refresh rates. Now, likewise, the response time of your monitor also doesn't matter much for productivity, but it does for gaming. Now, essentially, it is how fast what's on screen reacts to you typing or moving the mouse around or using your game controller, which when you're browsing the web, writing an email or you know, scrolling Twitter really isn't a problem on even the cheapest of monitors nowadays. For gaming though, it is important. Like, and the lower the better with many gaming monitors boasting like sub one millisecond response times. Now this Dell monitor has got a five millisecond response time. Again, it's more productivity focused. Whereas this screen over here has a 0.03 millisecond response time, which is very, very fast. The next thing that you need to consider when buying a monitor is the connectivity. Now for most PC users, this is either gonna be HDMI or display ports. And then for Mac users, it's gonna be HDMI or Thunderbolt 4 over USB-C. Now, in terms of HDMI, and again, generally speaking for productivity, it doesn't really matter. Now, as long as you have a HDMI port, you're pretty good. But if you do care about future-proofing or if you are a gamer, then you want to aim for something with HDMI 2.1, which is a newer version of HDMI that supports things like higher resolutions and faster refresh rates. But again, just like before, be aware that even though the monitor you're buying right now might have HDMI 2.1, the computer you're using today may well not. As of today, 
even the latest Nvidia expensive, like super expensive two grand graphics cards don't support HDMI 2.1. It's a similar story with DisplayPort 1.2 over DisplayPort 2.1 as well. So just make sure you've got that covered on your computer and your monitor. But if you are a Mac user, this is what I would say definitely something that's worth paying close attention to. Because from my experience, ideally the safest bet is to buy a monitor that has direct USB-C built into the display. And if you're a laptop user, one that also delivers power to you know charge your laptop, charge your device, whilst also connecting it to the display is like an essential thing to look for. If your Mac has an HDMI port, you'll likely be okay with HDMI, but I have reviewed many monitors and switched between like MacBook Airs, MacBook Pros, Mac Studios, Mac Minis, far too many times where I've encountered problems with getting the you know, full native resolution and refresh rates where I've been trying to use like docking stations or buying specific cables to convert USB-C to display ports where sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So my advice generally again here is just try and buy one with Thunderbolt 4 via USB-C or failing that, just be prepared to like, troubleshoot if HDMI doesn't really work the way you expect it to. Now, speaking of which, some extra features which you may be interested in on these monitors are the KVM features. Now, many monitors have the ability to simultaneously connect and display two devices at once, either side by side called picture by picture or big picture with a little window inside, which is called picture in picture. Now this can be useful if switching maybe between Mac and PC, gaming console and desktop PC, maybe a, a work and a personal machine. And some of these also come with the ability to hook up USB devices directly to the monitor. And then as you switch inputs from one computer to another, those USB devices move across with them as well. So you can use one keyboard, one mouse between two computers. Now the Dell 40 inch ultra wide monitor I'm using right here actually has a full hub built into it with uh, two and a half gig ethernet, USB-C, USB-A ports, which all of those again move over to whichever machine I'm using. Now that aside, there are some features which I find are a bit pointless on most monitors. Built-in speakers, convenient, yes, good, no. You are far better off hooking up to your own headphones or, or your own speakers. LED lighting also, totally pointless. Like considering most of us just you know, push our monitors up against the wall and the LED lights that are built in aren't bright enough to even see the you know, glow reflected on the wall, that you're better off just buying LED strips and mounting up behind your monitors if you really want that effect. So only if you are using the monitor in the you know, middle of a dark room with a back on display, only then do they really become even like partly useful. And then smart features and remote controls to a certain extent. Now I have a bit of a like love-hate relationship with these kind of remote controls. Unless you are buying an all-around monitor for gaming, productivity, and doubling up as something you can watch TV on or you know Netflix in the evenings. In which case, having smart features in your monitor and a remote control as well is pretty great. Otherwise, it's kind of a bit pointless. Like if you have smart features, most remote controls are set up like a TV remote, allowing you to get to the settings menu, access things like Netflix, you know, quick launch apps. Instead of the remote having monitor focused remote controls that would allow you to change inputs quickly and swap between predefined settings like game modes. Now, one area that is improved with a smart interface is the ability to keep your monitor up to date with the latest software, with firmware updates, installing automatically via the internet. Now, without a smart interface, firmware updates might have to be installed manually via USB drive, which can be a real pain in the if you are interested, here are some of my favorite productivity monitors. I'll link them all down below along with my reviews of them here on YouTube as well. Now, first is the absolute behemoth, which is the 57 inch Samsung G9 Neo. It is a 1000R curved mini LED screen. It has a great resolution. It's amazing for gaming and it works well with both Mac and PC. The only negatives are that it's not OLED and it suffers quite bad haloing, which is especially visible when turning on the screen every morning, which is a nice reminder that this isn't an OLED screen. Although it's not really a problem beyond that boot logo. I don't really experience it within Windows or Mac or anything like that. It also has no direct USB-C or Thunderbolt input, and it's just big and heavy. Oh, and if you play a lot of games, screens of this size can be a bit awkward with having to look to like the very far edges for heads up displays and those kind of things. Second, right now, the one I'm using, Dell 40 inch 
It's a 120 hertz IPS black panel. So really, really great colors, great contrast. It has Thunderbolt 4 and charges my MacBook Pro. And it has that full built in like whole kind of hub thing to hook up that two and a half gig ethernet and just a ton of like USB ports, my audio interface, my keyboard, my mouse and the webcam on there as well. Now it doesn't have the best response time at five milliseconds, but that aside, it is a fantastic monitor. And actually, I think this might be the best all round monitor to buy for both gaming and day-to-day -day productivity if you're a bit of an all-rounder. I'm thinking of making a full review of this monitor, so let me know down in the comments if you want to see that one. And then thirdly, it's another Samsung monitor. Now, this isn't sponsored or anything. I just generally like the super ultra-wide sizes, and Samsung seems to be really leading the way with those screens. This one is the 49-inch G9 OLED. Now, this one does have USB-C connectivity for your Mac, 240 hertz refresh rate, great colors, great contrast, and it's light due to it being OLED. The only thing I can really complain about here is that I just wish it had higher resolution, which is why I prefer the 57 inch version over the 49 inch model. But they really are like all of these are great monitors. And as you can probably tell, I kind of like these ultra wide monitors. So next, go watch my experience of switching to a super ultra wide monitor for the past five years right here.